My name is David Braun. I work with an organization called New Yorkers Against Fracking. And United for Action, which is a grassroots organization that I helped found that works here in uh, the New York City mainly area against hydraulic fracturing and promoting renewable energy solutions. In the wake of Sandy, we've found ourselves to be reeling from the effects that we experienced. In New York City, or New York State alone, more houses were demolished or adversely affected than Katrina. In New York State alone. That doesn't include any other areas, or New Jersey, which is uh, horrifically affected as well. So what we know is that we're very pleased to see that the governor is waking up. Governor Cuomo is waking up to the effects of climate change, how that creates super storms like Sandy, increases the storm surge, and causes the flooding that we saw. So we're thrilled that the governor is acknowledging that. What we'd also like to see him acknowledge is certain studies, like the International Energy Agency's assessment that if we exploit natural gas to its fullest potential, we will see a six degree rise in the temperature of the earth by 2035. That's what hydraulic fracturing and natural gas will bring us. We also know from some of the studies that have been done at Cornell University that methane, because methane seeps from the places where they drill and when you take into consideration the full life cycle of hydraulic fracturing, not just point of use, not just the burning of the fossil fuel itself, but when you take into consideration all of the truck trips, the methane seepage, that methane is actually on par or worse than coal, depending on the time frame that you look at it. So they're talking about natural gas from hydraulic fracturing being a clean energy solution, but don't be fooled. That's a lie. There is nothing clean about shale gas. And this is not a step forward for the state of New York. No matter how many jobs they claim it will bring, it is a step back, and that is not even considering the health impacts from the chemicals, the volatile organic compounds, and all the other hosts of issues that this causes. I'm speaking simply from the perspective of climate change, that it is absolutely untenable. And New York City and New York State will not stand for it. So we do hope the governor keeps that in mind. So it is with great pleasure now that I have uh, the opportunity to introduce a champion uh, in the assembly uh, of this issue and a good many other great progressive issues who is a representative here from the Upper West Side, Assemblyperson Linda Rosenthal. Linda. Thank you, David, and it is wonderful to be here. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Assemblymember Linda Rosenthal. I represent the Upper West Side as well as parts of uh, Clinton in uh, the New York State Assembly, and I say no to fracking. The, doc the documentary you are about to see chronicles a huge anti-fracking rally that was held in May in the state capitol in Albany, followed by a one-of-a-kind concert and educational event featuring scientists, musicians, and other notable guests. Now, we've all seen a lot of social movements take shape, but there are few that rival the anti-fracking movement in its diversity and momentum. And that's because the threat posed by fracking will impact all of us, regardless of where we live, whether it be in Ithaca, Syracuse, or New York City. Our water, our air, our environment are precious, and they should not be put at risk in the pursuit of the almighty dollar. It was the climate change deniers. <laughs> It was the climate change deniers, backed by big money from big polluters, looking for an even bigger payday that prevented us as a state from recognizing the dangers 
posed by climate change, and ultimately to take the steps we needed to prepare for a storm of Sandy's magnitude. Now it is those same polluters looking for another big payout at the expense of the people of this state and of the environment who are pushing the state to open our Marcellus Shale to fracking without knowing for sure the impacts of that practice on our environment, our water, our air, and most importantly, the health of our people. In the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, in recognition of all the people who are still displaced and will be for months to come as people debate, is climate change real? Is the sea level really rising? What should we do? Should we go back there? How will we prevent something like this from happening again? It just is simple a logic that says that we cannot proceed with fracking until we know with absolute certainty that it can be done safely. Now this brings me to the health impacts assessment study. Earlier today I spoke with uh, Dr. David Carpenter who serves as the director of the Institute for Health and the Environment at the University at Albany School of Public Health. He now heads a group that they just founded, the Coalition of Concerned Health Professionals of New York. He is incredibly concerned about the impacts that fracking could have on human health. Now it is mind-boggling that the original draft supplemental generic environmental impact study did not include a comprehensive analysis of the health impacts that fracking could have on people. After a huge outcry from scientific experts, medical professionals, but most importantly from tens of thousands of you, that the state is conducting a study that it had no intention of doing in the first place. Given the very real and very dangerous impacts that fracking has had in other states, such as Pennsylvania and Ohio, we know in New York State we cannot rush this process and embark on a path of potential ruin based on incomplete information. The people of this state deserve better, and it is up to the people in this room to demand it. The effort to ban fracking, which started with only a few people in a single room, has now morphed into a movement with thousands upon thousands of people demanding a fracking ban. This movement has been successful because of people all over the state getting educated and then getting together in opposition to a process that has the potential to devastate us all. So I will continue to fight in the New York State Legislature to prevent a practice that endangers the health and the well-being of New Yorkers and the environment. And I am certain that all of you will continue to be as loud and as energized and as active and as persuasive as you've been throughout this whole time. Thank you very much. It's very exciting to have uh, the assembly member here this evening because um, she's just such a champion and such a fighter for so many great things. Uh, so thank you, Linda. So I haven't always done this sort of work. Um, I used to just work a job, um, you know, to make money. And uh, there were times in my life where um, you know, you have these kind of low points because you see a lot of bad things going wrong in the world. And in a lot of those times, you turn to, to music, I think. And I honestly can say with all of my heart uh, that I don't think I'd be here doing this work were it not for some of the music that the person I'm about to introduce created. It's true. Yeah, um, Ophelia changed my life um, and kept my heart intact and kept my heart alive. So um, with that thought, it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce Natalie Merchant, who is the um, inspiration and, and created much of the music in the program for the movie that you're about to see. So Natalie. Hello, and thank you so much for coming this evening. Um, what is about to happen to you while you watch this film is you're going to use your left brain 
and then your right brain, and then your left brain, and then your right brain. And actually, what will happen is by the end of the evening, you won't feel overwhelmed. You'll feel inspired by what you're learning. And um, what you're going to learn is that if we don't act now, something irreversible and horrible will happen to our state that we love. So um, enjoy and learn and be inspired. Become angry, be devastated, be emotional. I'm tired of hearing that this is not an emotional issue. We're talking about our survival. If you're not emotional without that, you're dead. <laughs> You know, I've made a lot of films uh, and, uh, and a lot of different zip codes around the world. This is, and it's really rewarding to have made one in my own backyard. I've lived in the Hudson Valley for 25 plus years. I was, had a Brooklyn and Upper West Side experience before that. Um, but it's great to be, you know, the, the film is only, I don't know, six weeks old at this point. We've screened it a, a few times, but not that many, fewer than a dozen. But it's scheduled, I think, 25 nights out of the next 30 across New York State. Yeah. 
Uh, we're going to do a little Q&A in, in a minute, but I, I, I did, there, were, there were a few thank yous I, I wanted to, uh, to hand out before we continue. Um, this was an all-volunteer effort. You know, this was a big project, uh, starting with the, uh, the, you know, the, the meetings in our kitchen to kind of think about what it would take to put on the event in, in March, and then the concept of filming it and turning it in. Because the problem was that the egg in Albany seats 1,000, and it sold out, but we didn't want it to be only for 1,000 people. We wanted it to be for you guys and for everybody across New York. And we're getting all sorts of inquiries from California and Colorado and North Carolina because they frack in 34 states. So everyone in the film worked for free. I mean, it's stunning to me that we... And I, I, know, I know we've got a few of the folks who are in the film in the, in the room. I know I see Dan Zanes here in the front row and Eric De La Pena. I know that Natalie is here, obviously. Who are we forgetting? Oh, Elizabeth Mitchell and Dan. Yep. Anyone else? I didn't see everyone. So that's a, that's a, huge, that's a huge tribute. Um, the film itself was actually shot you know, for, as a, by another volunteer army by the great documentary filmmaker Alex Gibney, who arrived in Albany with a, with a crew of 15, and they, they spent all day shooting the, re the rehearsals, the rally, the film itself, and then at the end of the day handed me the hard drive and said, good luck. And th this, is, this is the result. Um, the goal of this film is slightly different from a lot of documentaries, is we want this to be seen as much as possible, as frequently as possible, as quickly as possible. So I encourage any of you, we, I think we handed out some cards in the lobby, there's information on how to contact us if you want to organize something in your, in your community, at a theater, and you know, shortly after the first year we're going we're gonna to make it available for, for simple things like house parties. But go to that, it's dear-governor-cuomo.com, go and, and it, there's information for how to contact us. We'll get you DVDs, we'll get you all of that. You know, we want this thing to be seen. The governor's office, like a lot of politicians, but not like all, but this governor's office responds to political, or to public opinion. Uh, when the DEC normally reviews uh, an environmental law, uh, typically they'll get a thousand letters thousand responses. In this case, they've got more than 80,000, you know, and the governor is responding to that. And I, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not so uh, uh, conceited as to think that, that something, uh, that media, even a film, can really have that much influence. But what it's doing is we're bringing it into rooms like this, we're energizing lots of people who then go out and talk about it, and the governor's office is listening to this, I guarantee. Uh, call the governor. Also, go to his Twitter page. Say, hey, I just saw this great movie. You should think about this. Uh, go to his Facebook page because his office responds to this stuff. They're very sensitive. They watch this stuff. Uh, you know, a phone call goes to a, perhaps an anonymous uh, answering machine in the basement of the Capitol. If you go to his Twitter page or his Facebook page, everyone who follows that sees it. Um, we're also, you know, keen on getting this thing distributed. If you have ideas about uh, uh, places where it can be shown around, around New York or outside of New York. We're looking for partners, you know, financial partners to help continue the promotion and distribution part. You know, the, the first part, the bulk of it was all volunteer, but now we have to actually pay to get this thing out there and, and, and seen. So we're open to, to any and all suggestion. On that note, I think we're going to do a little Q&A. I think David is going to come back and Julia Walsh from Frack Action. I don't know if I can get Natalie up here or not. Maybe, maybe not. Thank you. <laughs> I think the idea is there are a couple handheld mics. I don't know who's going to wrangle those, but uh, we, you know. Uh, we found, like, we have screened it a dozen times, we find that, you know, we've given enough speeches, you've heard enough music, but it probably has elicited or, or given some questions, so we'll try and address those. So, and if we can, uh, 
as the mic is past you, if you can keep your comments short or your questions kind of brief and concise. And can we work with these mics a little bit? We're getting off. Thanks. Um, so actually, yeah, I think that's actually a good call. So this is Julia Walsh from Frack Action. And uh, there's a lot going on right now uh, in the um, political situation with fracking moving forward. So Julia is just going to give us a brief update about where we are, what's going on. It's a little complicated, uh, but uh, she's going to kind of just take us through it, and then we're going to get to some questions. Well, the good news is it's not moving B forward Brief, right now. brief, brief. Very yes, briefly. Brief. Uh, and then people can ask questions if you have some. Uh, because of all the work that we've been doing, uh, the governor and the Department of Environmental Conservation did an internal health impact assessment, uh, an internal health review. And basically what's going on right now is they've hired three researchers to review the work that they've been doing on an internal health review. That process is ongoing. Because of that process, there's been a delay uh, in the regulations and right now because of uh, a larger set of rules and laws in the state, they have to restart up another round of public comments. So today that happened. It's a good, it's very good. Yeah, that was good. So right now we really have 90 days to convince the governor yet again not to move forward with fracking in New York and we're going to need all of your help. The public comment period runs from mid-December through mid-January. So I know you all signed up and, and put your emails on the petition. We'll have information and instructions about how you can do that. Uh, and we really just need to whack it out of the park this time. Um, just a quick story. I heard yesterday that the governor had a fundraiser in which uh, one of the, part, the people that came to the fundraiser asked him about this issue of fracking, what was going to happen. And he said that this is one of the biggest issues and movements uh, in the state's history. And And in short, we're doing a great job of getting our message out there, and the gas industry hasn't been doing a good job of getting their message out there. So we have to keep it up, and the only way we're winning this is with all of you and the people across the state who day in and day out are putting their energy and their hearts and minds into this battle, and together we're going to win. And so with that, a major kudos to all of the folks that are in here who have been working on this issue tirelessly. You People are absolutely amazing and um, it's this community that keeps me engaged in this fight and fighting as hard as I do. So thank you. So where are our microphones? Where do we have questions? Uh, great. So let's go for this woman here in the back on the aisle. We can, if we can get it working. There we go. Okay. As a native of Chelsea, uh, I was very concerned when I saw the sign coming in about Chris Quinn, who is on the fast track to becoming our next mayor. And I'd like to know from you who have been working in the city what you recommend we do because it's no, it's no secret that there's going to be an incredible groundswell supporting her because of the gay issue. Oh, well, <laughs> well, I, I heard that, Bruce. Well, you know, the more important thing is for you to answer. First, I'd like to know factually what has she done so far and not done regarding this issue? And what do you recommend we in the city do to deal with Chris? Yeah. I, you know, I, I don't live in the city, but I can speak to the role of the mayor. And, you know, we, we have a slight issue with the current mayor because he's, he's either naive or hypocritical. I'm not, I'm not sure which. Because, he, because he, you know, he, he has said that he thinks that fracking is good for New York State it's good for the economy of New York State, as long as it doesn't impact any waterway. 
So I guess all we can hope in that regard is that the next mayor, whoever it is, uh, has a slightly more enlightened uh, vision of how the, the, the how, how fracking works and how the state works and how waterways work. Yeah, and I do want to say that um, uh, Speaker Quinn was actually very instrumental in helping pass the first moratorium in 2010. Uh, and she did lead the city council in passing a resolution which was part of the holdup that, that led to the Delaware River Basin Commission halting and not moving forward with fracking, as did the mayor at the time. Um, but definitely just need to keep this on her radar. I'm not sure what she's been up to recently, but in the past she, w she was very good on the issue. And I do just want to highlight, and there are some folks, there's some folks here in the audience who have been working on the pipeline and coming into the West Village. Yeah. There's folks. There's, uh, Occupy the Pipelines here this evening and Sane Energy, Sane Energy Project and NYH2O has been working hard on it. There is actually a lawsuit currently to try and bite, block this pipeline. There's a pipeline coming in, 30-inch, uh, 32-inch pipeline. Uh, that's coming in high pressured, like the one that blew up in San Bruno a couple of years back that created a, a, a crater uh, half the size of a football uh, field and about four stories deep. They're putting that straight into the West Village, which is a, obviously has a greater amount of people living in that area. Um, there actually is an action if you want to be involved in that and keep pressure on people like uh, Speaker Quinn and on the mayor. You can participate with this. Their people will have flyers, but uh, there is an event going on at the Gansvort, uh, Hudson River at Gansvort Street this uh, Saturday at 1 p.m. So that's one thing you can do. All right, so, well, what's that? Yeah, the, and that's another important point to make. They're, they were supposed to actually break for the winter doing this construction. Um, we think because of political pressure, they're actually trying to accelerate it. So they're actually pulling through in a three-day period the pipeline. They've drilled the, the hole, the tunnel. They're going to pull through the pipeline. And once they get that thing set, then we're looking forward to radon-laced uh, fracked gas coming straight into our stoves and our kitchens and our oven. And so we want to block that from happening. So let's move on to the next question. Oh, I'm sorry, the event again is at Gansvor Street and the West Side Highway. So Gansvort is just a couple of blocks below 14th Street, way over in the meat pass packing district, right there on the West Side Highway. And that is actually the location where the pipeline is coming through from New Jersey. So that's like the point of entry. So that's been a place where a lot of people have been rallying and, and doing events. So. Very good. Uh, who's uh, the microphone? This who's got the microphone on this side? Microphone. Oh, you got the microphone. There's somebody behind you. who has got their hand up. Who's that? <laughs> oh, good evening. Good uh, evening. My, my name is David Galalza. I'm with New York Contra el Gasoducto, and I come tonight because um, I want to thank everybody in this room, David Braun in particular, and our friends at Sane Energy, and so many folks who came and worked with us on a campaign in Puerto Rico for the past two years against a 92 mile long gas pipeline. It's kind of like the, the mini Keystone in Puerto Rico because it's so small, the island of Puerto Rico, and it would have traversed some really sensitive areas and, and really done a lot of damage. But I want to report today a message of inspiration and hope against uh, the fracking and the frack gas that would have gone to Puerto Rico and, and against these pipelines that are trying to destroy um, New York and New Jersey and other places around the states, that we defeated the gasoducto a month ago. The people of Puerto Rico, <clears throat> Set up to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, the EPA, the Fish and Wildlife, all these different federal agencies, 80% of the people plus said no to the gasoducto, and we say no to frack gas, we say no to these pipelines here in New York State, we say no to the damage that all these corporations want to wreak on the United States and in the world. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. That wasn't a question, David. <laughs> but it was a welcome comment, because we don't win these things very often, and that was a profound win. 20,000 people marched through the mountains of Puerto Rico to put a stop to this pipeline. I know, exactly. Let's see that. Let's see 20,000 people in Albany the next time we have yeah. a round. 
And look, we've got 600 people here in this room here tonight. We, this, if we can get this out for a movie in just one part of the state, we can definitely do that. But it takes us all really getting engaged, engaging our friends, our neighbors, because it's a big industry and it's going to be tough to put a stop to them. But imagine how it's going to feel when we start, when we stop poisoning ourselves to power our lives. We start powering our lives with renewable energy and we no longer have our policies decided by corrupt corporations that don't care if they poison us. Sharon. Um, I just wanted to ask how many people here will be able to show up on Saturday to support the uh, this, the action to stop All right, the all right. show of hands. Who wants to come up. on Saturday? There we go. All right, that's good. Right. Great, thanks, Sharon. All right. Question uh, mark. Where's Where's our microphones? Question we have a couple questions here. down here in the front. Don't forget the balcony. Oh. Oh my goodness. Okay. Well, we'll we'll send somebody up here. You want to come down here? Actually, we'll make it easier. Is that you, Joe? That's Joe. Hi, Joe. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Okay, no problem. <laughs> How you doing? My name is Don Raskoff. This is the third time I've seen the film, and I want to thank all of you. I saw went to both nights in Beacon. Went to both nights. I'll start over again. My name is Don Raskoff. He's got the shirt. He's got the shirt. <laughs> Third time I've seen the film, I want to thank all of you for your work on this action. I'm a member of the Hudson River Soup Clearwater, and that organization, which Pete Seeger is one of the co-founders of that organization, which was instrumental in passing of the Clean Water Act 40 years ago. Today. Uh, over the past week since I've seen the film in Beacon, I've done a tremendous amount of research. I spoke to Mana Jo Green today, who's the uh, Environmental Justice Director at Clearwater, and she and I are going to meet this week to discuss my, me possibly becoming the fracking coordinator for Clearwater. Oh, great. Great. I want to thank you for that. Um, in my research, which has been pretty extensive, uh, one of the most fascinating things I discovered was National Geographic did a series uh, two years ago on fracking, National Geographic. The fine print says that the series was sponsored by Shell. <laughs> Unbelievable. So you can all go and look at that on National Geographic, Geographic's website. There's a Shell ad in the top right, and at the bottom in the fine print it says, thank you Shell for sponsoring this. Mm. So thanks again for your work. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. And then, so I'm sorry. So we had two over here. So this gentleman, and afterwards, this woman here in the room. You got it. Yeah. Uh, my name is Paolo Cremides. Uh, I'm from the Southern Tier. I'm originally from uh, Corning, New York. Um, the one thing that I've noticed uh, is that a lot of small Occupy groups have sprung up in the Southern Tier. There's actually a group called Occupy the Southern Tier, and Occupy Elmira, Occupy Corning, Occupy Ithaca. And these groups are, lead are leading the fight uh, against uh, hydro fracking in the both federal and state governments. Mm -hmm. um, my question to you is. Um, how do we see the connection between the gas company and people like Congressman Tom Reed, Congressman Dan Maffei, upstate congressmen who either are Democrats or Republicans but will uh, still endorse the industry? And I, the other thing that I think we have to highlight is that it's up to my generation to keep, going, to keep this fight going. It's up to my generation to get money out of politics and uh, stop the gas. So thank you. What, what are you suggesting? What are you suggesting we're too old? Huh? Are you suggesting we're too old? <laughs> Julia. Julia. <laughs> about the connections between the different like the officials and so uh, uh, as far as the question I mean I think you're just saying what is the connection between those uh, elected and the gas industry is that right where uh, well Congressman Reed is has headed up a Marcella shale uh, fracking committee in the Congress uh, this past election cycle we saw a lot of people being challenged and any incumbents being challenged on the congressional level in New York on this issue. Um, unfortunately, not many of them won, some of them won. Um, and on the, the state level, uh, it's, still, it's still a major issue. So uh, as far as how the fracking issue is kind of 
um, been a force in the, the local and the state and the national elections. I definitely think it's been a factor. Um, we still have a lot more education to do, uh, and the candidates themselves uh, have embraced the anti-fracking issue, but there's so much more education and work that needs to be done on the political level, and just in organizing the political party, it, it, parties themselves in order to actually have more traction. So in short, um, we saw some wins, we saw, saw some loss, losses, pretty much a, a wash overall on the issue in the, the general election. What we've seen, though, in a lot of the areas where fracking may come is there's this the kind of unspoken um, silencing that's going on with a lot of folks. That it, if you're talking to them one on one, they'll say that they're opposed to it, but in public sphere, they won't because they don't want to be the one to stop the gravy train. And what we've seen, though, and this has been documented in Pennsylvania, that that gets exacerbated uh, when the gas drilling companies actually do come in. Because what happens is people start complaining about their water being poisoned. Uh, but everyone's kind of on the dole. I mean, the gas industry got, starts giving money to local, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, elected officials, of course, but emergency services in other areas of the community. And so what actually we've seen is that the people who are complaining of their water being poisoned start becoming targeted as if they were the problem. So the victims somehow get turned around to being the perpetrators. And that's why it's important for us not to let that in here because we're going to increasingly see more of that. And it's a shame when the victims become the ones that are targeted as if they were the perpetrators. That's a, just a crying shame. So anyway, I think I said this woman over here. Uh, she said she uh, oh. answered the question before. Oh. Well, very good. Uh, maybe not? Hi, Paul. Thank you. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question on the timing of the um, hearing. As I understood it, uh, and it, I may be wrong, uh, there were three people who are going to be doing health studies. And I, what I understood is that they aren't going to have enough time to really do a good analysis by the time of this next hearing. And so the question is, what should our message be to Governor Cuomo and to our state legislators about this hearing and what, what, do we, what do you want to, us to say to him that's the most effective for this period? Thanks. Well, right now, one of the main messages that we need to keep amplifying is that of the health professionals themselves. So hundreds of medical professionals from across New York just this week uh, started this group concerned health professionals of New York, ConcernedHealthNY.org. Um, and basically, their demand is for a full, comprehensive health impact assessment. Um, and that would require public scoping and public comment periods. Right now, uh, this is basically a internal secret health review that was created by the DEC and is now being looked over by these three people with no specifics. No one in the public knows, aside from a couple of comments, one of the experts has made to several uh, media outlets. So right now, you know, as far as the health is concerned, we need to back up our our health professionals here in New York and making that demand for the comprehensive uh, HIA, which would require actual public participation. Um, and how we nuance that with these regulations, which is a totally different process, um, it has remains to be seen. Uh, but in short, that's, that's what we should be doing uh, right now. Because I don't really want to get to like, there's the whole nuance of it, but basically, the environmental impact statement that the state is currently reviewing, um, that is going to be part of it. The health piece is going to be part of that general overview. The regulations should come after that and be based off of the environmental impact statement. But this whole process is really a botch job. The main thing that they're paying attention to right now is how much political force we have to stop this industry. That's really what it comes down to. And as long as we keep the heat up and the fight up, they are not going to move forward because this governor has presidential ambitions and he does not want to leave New York with any poisoned people uh, basically pointing the finger at him when he runs for, for the primary in 2016. Yeah, over here. Hi, my name is... Sorry, go ahead with the clapping. Um, my name is Nicole, and I'm from New York. And John, 
And Natalie, I'd love to hear your stories about how you got involved in the frack movement, the anti-frack movement. How I got deeply involved was I went to Binghamton at the request of the members of the Horseflies, and that's the band that's in the, um, the acoustic, incredible acoustic band that is in the film. They're based in Ithaca. And after the event, I met families from Dimick, Pennsylvania, who had been um, victimized by Cabot, Cabot Oil and Gas. And they told me about their three and a half year struggle trying to get replacement water and trying to get restitution from Cabot. And it broke my heart. So I think that's when I decided that I didn't want to meet hundreds of families in New York 10 years from now holding jugs of contaminated water and sobbing in my arms and saying, what can we do? Can you help us? So that's how I started. Uh, me, I, I was standing on the periphery of these meetings uh, prior to uh, the Albany event, trying to stay as far away as I could from the subject. And then the, then the, the, the question was asked, well, who, who can write a script for this? And I, I, I kind of tried to stay out of it, but then I got... <laughs> um, no, it, it, yeah, so that, that, that's really what happened. And, and after the event in May, and once we had this incredible footage, you know, uh, of course we wanted to, to share it, so that was pretty, pretty simple. I just actually want to bring uh, Bet Abroad from uh, Frack Action up, just to make a kind of a quick announcement for us, and then we'll go on and we'll take uh, a couple more questions. But I did just want to say, John, that's what happens to us all. We all just kind of get sucked into it. Yeah. My name is Bet Abroad, and I'm an organizer with Frack Action, a nonprofit that is working to stop fracking. Uh, we're proud members of the New Yorkers Against Fracking Coalition. And New Yorkers Against Fracking was launched in May of this year. And in the eight months since, we've accomplished some amazing things, including grown to over 180 organizations across the state, recruited over 1,000 businesses against fracking, recruited 300 faith leaders against fracking, delivered over 360,000 petition signatures to Governor Cuomo, generated over 10,000 calls to Governor Cuomo, helped organize the Don't Frack New York rally in Albany with several thousand people, organized dozens of rallies, vigils, film screenings, and other events across New York. These accomplishments are your accomplishments. We couldn't have done any of this without you, without your presence, your support, your involvement. And the results have been extraordinary. Against all odds, we've managed to hold off fracking in New York. But we have a lot more to do. We need to redouble our efforts to build a movement that has the power to take on the oil and gas industry and win. And to do that, we need more of your time, your energy, and your financial contributions. It was thanks to a generous contribution from Sandra Steingraber, who donated the money she received from winning the Heinz Award, that we were able to launch New Yorkers Against Fracking. Now, we need your financial support to help sustain and grow this amazing movement, your movement. This woman's been holding her hand up for quite some time there. This woman? This, this woman, woman is Jessica yeah, Roth. Jessica hi, Roth. everybody. Oh, hi, Jessica. <laughs> I've been in, involved in uh, with New Yorkers Against Fracking for the last year and a half, and I've spent the time since Sandy working out in the Rockaways, and I want everybody in here to know that there's a lot that has to get done to sort of tie together all of these pieces, and it's all happening in the Rockaways right now. For anyone who doesn't know, the Rockaway Pipeline was just snuck through Congress while, and the President, thank you very much, while Rockaway was literally still in the dark. And it's a shambles out there, the infrastructure is crumbling, there's still no energy in many of the places, and we're really working on rebuilding with communities in a green, sustainable way that creates green jobs and green energy and moves everybody forward. There's so much to be done on all of these different areas and there's so much you can get involved with. If you check out uh, interoccupy.net, there's loads of opportunities and we need, we really need people like all of you because we got plenty of volunteers but we need organizers on the ground, people who can actually make things happen and every single day we're out there and the fight is ongoing, so please join us. Josh Fox just made another short video uh, that's about Occupy Sandy and the work that's being done out there. 
If you haven't seen it, uh, go to OccupyTheClimate.org. Great, very good. Great work, Jessica, that you're doing out there. You guys are doing amazing stuff. Okay, all right. Thanks, Jess. All right, Joe, you want to say something? I'm Joe. I'm working with uh, a couple of groups, uh, um, Union Civic Action Group and Move On Council, which is a, a small part of, of Move On administration. I'm trying to get Move On to adopt this as a program. We're working on a project that can have a mass market for distribution of movies like this, and that is we want to get to the churches in the Marcellus Shale, the pastors and the congregations, to see Gasland and to see this. If you have any ideas on how we can get distribution, we ha we'll get the people, we'll get the venues. If anybody wants to volunteer, we can use your help. Thank you. All right. Several times in, the, in both the commentary and the movie, it's um, made reference to the number of people that have already agreed with the gas companies and signed these contracts. And I'm wondering how binding those are and if any but he has tried to get out of them and successfully, and if you have any advice for people that are trying to get out of them or have you know, changed their mind or you know, what the feeling of that is for the history. Many times the leases that are signed are for like five year periods. Uh, there was just a court ruling this past week that uh, during the moratorium in New York, the gas companies were trying to say that by a force majeure or act of God, basically, they were unable to access the gas underneath and therefore their leases should just automatically be extended um, uh, for the time period during the state's moratorium. Uh, and the court struck that down. So there's, um, it's really good. Uh, so there's a number of leases coming up. Uh, the way in which we know where the leases are is the counties have to, basically when you sign a lease, there's a lien on your property uh, for the mineral rights. So they have to file that with the county. There's been no state registry uh, and it's usually county by county and sometimes you have to go lease uh, by lease in the county. It's, it's, very, it's been very complicated and um, it's a, a long process. Uh, just quickly, there's an organization called Fleeced, which is landowners who feel like they've uh, been exploited by the gas industry. So we strongly encourage people to join that organization. Uh, they become their own kind of landowners coalition within themselves because there's a very strong membership within that organization. And so they're also fighting it legally and I think otherwise as well. And they're very impressive what they've done, so. Yeah, and just to say that there's a new movie coming out that Matt Damon's in called Promised Land in which he's actually a landman to go and get those leases. So America will soon be finding out more about how these landman and these leases are signed um, and, and how corrupt the, the practice and um, the way that they lie to people to get them to sign those leases has been. Challenging the Halliburton loophole, legally. Chal legally challenging the Halliburton loophole. That seems loophole. to be the root of all of this. Um, I, you know, I actually, I can't really speak to a legal challenge. I don't know if that's something maybe I should throw over to Joe Levine if you know anything about that. I, I know that doing it legislatively is pretty much impossible, um, especially with the climate um, with the House. The House will never pass it and I think that we probably won't even, wouldn't even see Obama sign it at this point just because he's afraid of, of looking like he might oppose jobs. So I'm going to actually ask a question um, of Natalie and John uh, since we're asking a lot of more technical questions. Um, what is the, what is going to be happening now with the film um, in the upcoming months and, and what do you want to do in seeing the film grow? Yeah. Well, as I said, the, the film is going to show, I think, 20, a couple dozen times in the next 30 days. Um, after the first of the year, we're going to continue to push it across New York State, but we're also literally going state by state uh, because despite the fact that the film is very New York-centric, the education is relevant no matter where you live. The advantage we have in New York is we actually have a really direct ask, which is don't do it. Most states, it's already happening, and they, it's hard to reverse those gears once it started. But they still are interested in showing the film because of the, you know, we've, we've done these screenings and we meet so many people after the fact who say, I had no idea. I mean, you're a different crowd. You're much more committed. But in, in most audiences, people just don't know what it looks like, what the impacts are, etc. So uh, we're going to continue to show it across New York State. It's going to show uh, across the country. We've talked with distributors who are going to eventually, in the next few months, put it online, you know, which will grow the audience even, even more. But uh, for, the, for the moment, uh, you know, we're, we're really liking this, this hands-on process. 
Just last week, I received a letter from a woman who lives in a small farming community in southern Illinois, and on the strength of a rumor that I was somehow involved in the anti-fracking movement, she wrote to me and asked me, what can I do to explain to my neighbors that this is something we don't want to welcome? And this film is a tool that is packaged in a very thin, small package that I can now put in the mail and send to her and say, we'll show this to your neighbors. And that was the reason we made the film. And it's amazing that it, people are actually coming to us now. Yeah, that's right, people are coming to us. And, and in, 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 a, in a more kind of finished response to an earlier question, the, the reason I was interested in making this film is because the last film I made was the first film I'd made in the United States for a long time, and it was in Louisiana where everyone has a relationship with water. Uh, rivers, swamps, bayous, creeks, the Mississippi, the Gulf, etc. And they have some of the most horrific environmental problems in, in the country, and it is now a fracking capital. But while it was in Louisiana, everyone said, don't let this shit happen in your backyard. So I got inspired by, by their, their encouragement. Yeah. And actually, I have just a quick question for Natalie. Um, what was the process like for you in terms of putting together this concert? I mean, it came together fairly quickly, right? What was it? Uh, lots of begging. <laughs> I've never asked favors of anyone, and I spent three weeks on my knees calling people I would never uh, thought I would call and ask a favor of. So um, getting out of the comfort zone, and, um, and we had incredible results. People came, and people who couldn't come, like David Byrne, or like the Low Anthem, and Paul, so- Paul Simon. Paul Simon, a lot of people said, I can't be there, but you can use my song. Every song that is in this film was given to us gratis. We have the rights for free. So, <laughs> it was an exercise in groveling, and I'm really glad I went through it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, but the other point of that was that, you know, one of the things, fun things for us to watch was when these musicians gathered, and we're going to say there were 30 of them, many of them were, were very impressed just to be on stage with each other, because most of them had not met, they certainly never played together, yet you had some of the world's best at this or that or this or that, all of a sudden on one stage, and some of the musicians all of a sudden found themselves kind of standing around going, I can't believe I'm on the stage with... Well, we'd with. say, someone should take a, an organ solo. Hey, how about John Modeski? He's <laughs> right. like, oh, and who do we have on bass? Michelle Indicicello. Right. <laughs> oh, what about drums? Jerry Murata. I mean, we had some, some of the greatest you know, musicians living in America today, and some, many of them under the radar, but right. amazing. Uh, my name is Carol Seidelman, and I just want to thank you. Somewhere in the film, they, you mentioned that there's a surplus in other states. So can't that be used as a deterrent? We, we already got enough and we have extra from these other fracking uh, interventions. And also, I don't see how the fact that France and Italy and all these countries in Western Europe, it would have no influence on legis legislators. That seems to me amazing. Last point is I saw the film the other night. I saw it at a special screening, the Matt Damon one, and you really should get some sort of piggyback program to get, you know, to get the films out together or something. Be okay. good. Great, thanks. Um, I mean, I'll just say, in short, the reason why there's a surplus of gas is because fracking is actually a Ponzi scheme, um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a way. So that's a whole, it's a whole other topic. But. And, and, I, and I just want to weigh in briefly. There are actually five exports. So we used to import natural gas about 10, 12 years ago. They're, they're changing those import facilities to export facilities. Huh. They can sell it for here for 2 to $3. They can sell it in China for 15 Shell has openly said that they're interested in exporting it. That's a business model decision for them. This is what all these folks want to do. FYI, the companies that want to do this, Exxon, Shell, Chevron, um, BP, uh, sound familiar? Um, they're running out of oil, and this is their future for how they stay alive. They're very well aware that once we start plugging in our electric cars into our solar panels, that they will be like the dinosaurs they drill. Dead. Yeah. So very good. I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to Corinne. I think just one. I just want to make one plea. It's one thing. Uh, we'll try. We'll try and get there. Um, it's one thing to say that you are actually opposed to something, which um, I think is kind of an easy thing to do. Uh, but it's a whole other thing to actually do something that is consistent with what you say. Uh, but the amazing thing about doing something is you become realized 
in that process, right? When you say something is bad and then you actually do something, whatever level that something is, whatever level you're comfortable, but when you do something that's consistent with your words, you become aligned, you become realized. So Corinne's gonna talk about how you can become realized with us in this work. All right. So, all right, let's give them all a round of applause because they did a great job. My name is Corinne Rosen, and I'm an organizer with Food and Water Watch, a nonprofit consumer watchdog organization that supports a ban on fracking. We are proud members of New Yorkers Against Fracking. In a moment, I'm going to discuss things that you can do to pressure Governor Cuomo to ban fracking while strengthening and building our movement. But first, I want to thank everybody that is in this room. Um, we are all part of what has become the largest grassroots movement in New York history. And whether you've made a, a phone call or started an organization, which I saw many people in this room who have done that, um, everybody is contributing uh, to building this movement. So thank you very much and give yourselves a round of applause. Um, right now is an extremely busy time. We just had Thanksgiving and we have more holidays that are coming up. But we need you to stay more engaged than ever. We can't take a step back. We have to move forward and work even harder. And there's four things that we need your help with. First, we need to keep the heat on Governor Cuomo. We need to keep calling his phone lines. Um, if a lot of times the phone lines are bill, uh, busy, uh, the messages are full, we need to keep calling those. Um, and we have something called uh, Call Cuomo Mondays. So every Monday, you can call Governor Cuomo with thousands of other people across the state of New York. Um, the second thing is we need to continue to build the movement. We just saw this amazing movie, um, and it's a great tool to get new people engaged and educated on what's going on with fracking. And thanks to John Bowermaster's generosity, we have the opportunity to hold similar screenings, like he mentioned, all across the state and spread this movement. So right now, I just want you to put your hand up if you think that you can have three people over to your house or possibly hold a screening in your church or activity center, please raise your hand. Okay? Thank you. Okay. We know who you are. We're going to follow up with you. Um, the third thing is we need to make sure our voices are heard. We know that there's going to be a 30-day comment period that Julia talked about on the proposed fracking regulations. But we don't want fracking to be regulated. We want it banned. And we plan on flooding them with tens of thousands of comments saying that we want a ban. But we need you guys to both write the comments and get your friends and family to write comments too. And lastly, we need you to stay connected with this movement. New Yorkers Against Fracking is going to hold a follow-up meeting um, to this screening on Tuesday, December 11th at 7 p.m. And this is going to be at Holy Name Church, which is on the Upper West Side. The address is 207 West 96th Street. At the meeting, we're going to be discussing and planning our next steps to mobilize New Yorkers to ban fracking. Thank you very much, and together we're going to win this.